Hello, my name is Ran and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode we interview inspiring movers, thinkers and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. If you love yoga, movement and meditation, you are listening to the right podcast. Now, I'm a little bit under the weather today, so I'm going to make this intro as quick as I possibly can. Today's episode is a recorded conversation between myself, my lovely co-host Joe Stewart, and Jace Tepatu. Jace is a yoga teacher based in Wellington, New Zealand. He has such a lot of good stuff going on. He heads up his studio, Power Living Wellington, He facilitates men's groups and is leading the charge in creating discussions around men's mental health. He also recently created M3 Mindfulness, which is an initiative introduced to schools in New Zealand that incorporates mindfulness, yoga and Māori mythology. Now this episode really means a lot to me. As a Māori and a man myself, I really resonated with a lot of what he has to say. I feel the work he's doing is incredibly important and I think this was a great discussion. Now this is definitely enough from me, I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Thanks so much for uh, speaking with us today Jace, it's so good to talk to you. We've been to some of your classes back in New Zealand and I, I really had a great time there so I've been really looking forward to speaking with you. I guess we should start at the beginning. Uh, I understand you were brought up by your grandparents and spoke Māori from a very young age so I'd really love to hear what that was like. Yeah, uh, I was really fortunate. I see it as a fortunate thing to be brought up by my grandparents and they were of the era that in New Zealand uh, they were punished for speaking Māori at school. Mm-hmm. And I remember my grandmother telling me about being wrapped over the knuckles with a ruler, which talking to other people from that era was actually commonplace. So in order for them to kind of keep the culture alive, they taught my generation, my dad's generation, uh, who was being brought up, uh, his brothers and sisters were being brought up at the same time as being brought up with me because he was still at home when he had me. He was only uh, 16 when he had me, which is why we were whangai by our grandparents. His generation, my dad's generation, wasn't allowed to speak Māori, so I was really fortunate that my grandparents wanted to keep the culture alive and teaching me and my brother it. And so I didn't speak English until I started uh, school, at primary school at five. And I suppose it's been really good to be able to have two cultures, like mm-hmm. being brought up Māori and then also you know, like starting to go to school and I was fortunate enough to go to some, uh, a really uh, fine boarding school here in New Zealand. So I got the best of both cultures. I was versed really well in Māori and versed really well in the English system as well. So, Did you grow up in quite a rural environment? Was like nature a big part of your childhood? No, not at all. No, well, in the weekends we did. So uh, as part of Māori culture, we have... Uh, what's called a marae. A marae is kind of like a, what's the best way to describe it? It's kind of like a big, well, it's a it's a little um, community, I suppose, where your tribe that you belong to um, kind of occupies that area. And that's your kind of like central place. It's kind of way of the community, your immediate family, first cousins, etc., cetera, and uh, to kind of convene. So on the weekends, we'd go out into the farm. So that was really rural. Uh, but you know, I was brought up in a city, uh, which <laughs> in New Zealand terms is only 30,000 people. Uh, and so, yeah, I really, even in that way, got the best of having been out in the, in the weekends going up to the marae and being rural and, you know, running around in the paddocks and uh, gathering up the sheep and, you know, uh, being surrounded by, by my cousins in that way, but then also having a city lifestyle. My grandparents spoke Māori to us, even though we got to speak English once we started school at five. They also spoke to us in Māori when we were at home, so we kept getting that uh, that kind of cross-cultural input, I suppose, which is really beautiful. I, uh, I look back at my childhood really fondly and, and, and really grateful for it. Excellent. And was it much of a challenge actually coming into an English-speaking school? To be honest, I can't really re- remember. I what I do remember is going to play school, 
and back in the day, this is before Kohanga Reo, well, it's just, uh, we have in New Zealand for the Aussie listeners, we have Māori, what do you call it over there, kindergarten? or Yeah, kinder? yeah. Yeah, we have where you speak just Māori and you have Māori practices, like um, starting the day and ending the day with karakia, which is prayer. And all of that is, everything is done in Māori, every t- all the lessons are taught in Māori. So I went to a kindergarten that was kind of bilingual. Mm-hmm. And so I started to immerse myself and start to hear English. And, you know, my uncles and aunties and even my dad were around at home. They still conversed in English, mm-hmm. but I was mostly spoken to by my grandparents and taught everything Māori. So I had an ear for English, mm-hmm. but I didn't really learn it until I started to, uh, yeah, at school at five. Excellent. And did you, growing up, have a spiritual practice and was it rooted in Māori spirituality? Totally. And so everything, this is, well, you guys know that I teach yoga. And mm-hmm. So what really resonates with yoga for me is that all of the teachings, and this is very similar to any kind of spiritual practice, like I'm being really uh, immersed myself in Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen Buddhist master, mm-hmm. and all of his writings because... When you look at spirituality at face value, they're all really saying the same thing. So going back to my res- why I resonate so much with yoga is that it's all the things that I was brought up with that my grandparents taught me about about revering Mother Earth and taking mm-hmm. care of her because that's where we came from. That's where we'll return when we pass. About taking care of all of the elements, you know, taking care of our animals as well because they're living creatures and we're connected to them which is what yoga speaks of that that we are connected to everything and that Mm. there is light and spirit in everything in the world and there's that connection to everything that we are one is another really simple way to say that and we speak about that in maori culture as kotahitanga Mm -hmm. and that oneness we speak about in yoga is the yoking of you know all things our remembering that here in this flesh suit of humanness that we're here inhabiting on earth here, that we are actually connected all through energy to spirit, just like everything that I was taught being brought up. So I didn't really look at it as spiritual. When like I was that's young. just how things are. Yeah, I was just like, oh, that's just what I was taught and that's how I was brought up. And I'll say karakia, I'll say a little prayer and uh, to the food that I'm having. And that was just my... You know, customs and the way that I lived was brought up. So it just became commonplace. And it's not until I started going to school that I realised, oh, okay, you guys do that differently. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And started yeah. to be conditioned by the, for want of a better word, just a different system that I suppose without disrespecting it and just saying like, oh, you guys don't do that how I do. So when I started yoga, like I said, I just, it just seemed like, oh, this is what I've learned all my life and making shapes is just a way for us to connect back to the greater and it's just been a really beautiful marriage of seeing how yoga and and my Maori customs and spiritual practices really align and same with Buddhism Buddhism is just a to me anyway is a set of beautiful practices that allow us to find more love and compassion and kindness in our lives it's all the same thing, really. All the same thing, but just uh, Māori says it in a different language. Yoga says it with different practices. Buddhism does it with different practices. Taoism does it with different practices. And they're all saying the same thing, which is really basically just more love. <laughs> mm, How did it go, going from like a really like earthy, natural, connected childhood to coming into boarding school? Were there a lot of rules? Like was that a little bit of a struggle? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, my grandparents were quite strict because they also came from the 50s, right, where everything mm-hmm. was quite a uh, uniform. And I remember grandfather, he was really a really proud man. And so he taught me, I like, would be up at 6 a.m. and I was really good at sport. And so was my brother. And so we were up, I remember going to swimming at like 5 a.m., getting up, going to sw- him, getting up as well. And he spent two years or three years in the military quite early on because it was like mm-hmm. uh, post-war. And so, yeah, we, we were really strict. So I uh, enjoyed that, that strictness of boarding school, but not really one way for all. 
which uh, which I really struggled with at, at school because I was taught to be myself, right? Mm. But, you know, with some certain structure in our day so that we got up and we, we practiced, and we did our karakia and then we went off and did our things with structure, but still the ability, my grandparents gave us the flexibility to fully be ourselves and do what we yeah. wanted. When I went to boarding school, it was like, no, actually, this is... So I, for example, Eton, I don't know if you know Eton School, which is where the Royals... Yeah, I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, well, that was our brother's school. So everything that, that we had at boarding school was based on their system, which is very English and very right. Engl- Anglican. And just, I remember one of our, our senior masters saying, we want you to be men and one type of man. Mm. Wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I know, and I, I just remember getting, like, turning my nose up and getting in trouble going, I was, I was like, but I don't want to be one type of man. I got, for example, I suppose this sums it all up, I was a head prefect of one of the houses, and I got demoted because I refused to get my hair cut in the standard way, short back and sides. So everyone even had to have the same haircut? Same haircut, we had to wear the same uniform, and... I mean, there's something in discipline. I really get that. But I was already disciplined with, you know, representing New Zealand in various sports. So there was, that wasn't an issue for me. I just struggled with not allowed to really be myself and have my own and develop my own character. You know, if they were running off that man, that mantle of you will be a man, and that man was modelled around such an English kind of stiff upper lip almost. Mm-hmm. My words, I again don't want to offend anyone, but uptight kind of way of being, then that it didn't allow any form of expression, which I was used to having been brought up by my grandparents. Do you think that like yoga is like, it really resonated with you because it actually is that balance of kind of discipline and focus and practice, but also exploring who you are and what's unique about you. Like that's where it can kind of come together. You, n- you nailed it. Like when I'm, as I'm speaking to you now, I'm realizing that just explaining the school system and where I fit into it and that I didn't feel like I fit is because there was this constant like swaying towards we just want you to be, let's just look at it yin and yang. They mm-hmm. just wanted us to be young. And, but there was also a yin side to me that didn't fit into that model. And yes, I do. I fully agree with you. You know, yoga is that. It's both of those things. And they and I, I've said in many interviews about yoga is that yoga has really allowed me to step into who I really am, mm-hmm. not who the world that or I think I should be. And that and that is and that's really the, another way to say it is that beautiful balance between the two of yin and yang. It's those two opposites. They come together in a really beautiful, harmonious way. And that's, that's why I love yoga so much. You got it. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Yeah. I'm also wondering as well, like I know you do a lot of work with men now. Was that early kind of forceful point of view of this is what a man is, something that's kind of shaped the way that you want to help men discover who they are now? Is that kind of fed into your work today? Totally. I'm also gay. But then... I don't identify with that. Like I suppose my biggest message is allowing men to be who they are without having to fit within a model of Mm. what Mm. a modern male should look like. And I feel, and you know, this is quite general, but I feel that there's still that stigma of having to be, you know, the tough Kiwi bloke, but Mm. that's so antiquated and not if you were just to look at the way where we are in society now, that's not, that's not who we all are. Mm. And so as men start to struggle with that of who they are, that's where the mental challenges and, and, uh, and sense of identity of being a male, I've been doing some work with Youthline and I know that a lot of their conversations with men growing, with boys growing up, but Youthline is uh, is kind of like lifeline but for youths, mm-hmm. that the male conversations are around, I don't fit the model of what a um, Kiwi male is, which just breaks my heart because what even is it and who even says what you should be? 
That's where the mental challenges come in with our youth because they're struggling to identify where they fit into the supposed societal version of how you should be as a Kiwi male growing up. And so, oh gosh, you can't win. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I, and I guess there's also sort of preconceptions about what it's like to be a Māori male in particular. And, you know, I don't think I fit into into that kind of mould at all. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a nerd, I guess. And I sort of struggled with that, with, you know, the Māori side of my family. They, they were all a bit sort of bigger than me. So I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this. <laughs> but... I don't know what I'm hearing you say is that a sense of not really feeling like you belonged. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I struggled with that too because here I was. I remember getting shit from my cousins. And, you know, we're good now because Mm -hmm. they see uh, there's a bigger thing that I want to kind of talk to a little later on. But uh, I struggled because, you know, I was was brought up being Māori. And then when I started going to, when I won a scholarship to go to the sporting school, then I was too Pākehā, I was too white. Mm. So then you can't win. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Because there's your cousin who only speaks Māori and can't speak English, and now he goes to English school and he thinks he's up himself because he's at a flash school. And so I remember my cousin saying to me, oh, you don't fit in here. Mm. And I remember thinking but you don't speak Māori and we're at a marae where, you know, that we're, it's so steeped in Māori tradition and I'm the only one in our family line that can, but it doesn't make sense to me that you're judging me that, you know what I mean? But, I but you're not Māori enough, even though you've sort of taken on a lot more of the culture, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah. You know, there was a sense of not really belonging for me, for sure, because because it was like, well, you know, I'm not Māori, I'm not Māori enough. And then at school, I was the only one of two brown boys in right. the school. And so then I was not white enough. And then I was gay. And so there was no, there was a sense of not belonging all the way through. But um, thankfully, I had the groundedness of my grandparents to allow me to just be myself and them not ever judging me and always supporting me in whatever I chose to do that really allowed me to kind of step into my skin and be comfortable in it. Mm-hmm. They sound pretty amazing. Mm. I know that you're really sporty as well and you've actually represented New Zealand in three different sports. Did that team that aspect theory. of sport kind of help you as well? Or could you tell us a bit yeah. about your sporting yeah. life? Yeah, more the, the sports that I did were individual sports. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I always was a team player uh, mm-hmm. at well, I, I mean, I loved rugby and I, I suppose it came down to that, that whatever I put my mind to, I was, I was always tenacious and I always worked hard and always, well, I already had that discipline from such a young age. And always, I, I, I met a school friend the other day and he said, you were always quite grounded and clear about, well, I'm going to be, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it really well quite focused is the, is the word mm-hmm. which again is what I love about yoga because it does it's it's individual it's an individual journey but I suppose that individual journey of me being and, and excelling at that in those individual sports really allowed me a way of saying that in a yogic way is I was able to connect to myself quite quickly and on a deep level and so because of that I was able to connect to others quite well as well I guess as well like I'm not a sporty person but I know like say you go to a yoga studio and everyone's there doing your own practice but just being in that community and that room of everyone practicing together like has a little bit of that aspect of I guess belonging of you know feeling at home feeling that group energy you got it my friend I you got it Justine and I have we call it the marae in the sky. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> because when you come up to our place, it's in the middle of the city, you guys both know, and it's a sense of it doesn't matter what race, what creed, what size, what, what level of practitioner you are, what you've even, it doesn't matter what you are. We, it's, we wanna, want you to feel like you belong. That, that was really, it was, our word is inclusive. It's, this is for everyone. 
and, and yoga is, like you said, it's an individual practice, but when you're in there breathing, moving with other people, it's so powerful and potent that you can't but know that you are connected not just to yourself on your own individual mat, but connected to others as well. There's that, it, it, it transcends your race, your creed, what you identify with yourself or yourself as in your life. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, we really got that um, really welcoming, inclusive vibe when we came to your studio. And I think the way that you do a lot of mental health work with people as well, it's like we all struggle sometimes and sometimes we have really happy times as well, but that's all just part of being human. And it seems like that's something that you really embrace in your practice and in your teaching. I really want to talk about, uh, like I feel as teachers, I know you know this is that we as a yoga teacher especially because it's speaking not just to your body but to your mind and to what goes on in your waitawa or your heart is that you we have a responsibility and the responsibility to hold space for people wherever they're at and so sometimes there's a tendency not so much here in New Zealand but I've been to classes around the world where Yoga teachers have almost, it's almost been like condescending and a separatism of I've done the work and you need to listen to me because if you don't, then you won't be saved almost. Right. And it's been on a rare occasion, but it's almost been like a us and them approach. But as I said, when you walk into our place, we want to make sure that you a, you feel like you belong, and then B, there's a responsibility. I have all my teachers who I train at our studio, I want to make sure that they're holding space for everybody mm-hmm. and whatever they're going through in their lives. An example the other day is this woman, beautiful Māori lady, had been absent for six weeks, and I emailed her and I said, I hope you're okay because I haven't seen you and you're, she's normally practising five times a week. She came in that day, I had meditation class, and she sat, and uh, it was only a 20-minute meditation led, guided by me, and then afterwards, I went up and gave her a hug, and then she just started bawling, and after, I just let her have her space, and I just sat with her, and there was no talking, and then she basically said, "I my sister has passed away, and I've been looking after her, and this is the only place that I felt safe enough to let myself go. Wow, and And that's so beautiful that you were that space for her. Like imagine if she didn't have that one place that she could come to just to find that peace going through such a difficult time. Like if you hadn't have emailed her, like maybe you wouldn't have even known that all of that was going on, but you would still be that for her. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it humbles me and and. You know, when I get caught up in the, the got to pay the bills and the business mm-hmm. side of things, which I, I uh, struggle with because I would, I would love to do this for free, but I've also got to pay rent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got to live as well. Yeah, yeah. It, having her come into our studio and have it as a space where she can feel safe enough to let her guard down and just cry her eyes out because in her life she's had to hold it together for her family is freaking that to me it means more than anything and that's and that's what we've tried to create is the space where there's no separation between you and me as the teacher it's 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 like home yeah it's so beautiful mm. I mean, like when Ran um, was going through his illness, like our local studio was definitely that space for me where you could just kind of like yin especially was so powerful for me because I could just kind of let go of everything else that was going on and just breathe and just be present. And I always felt better afterwards. Like I always felt like I had just recharged a little bit and I could kind of go back out into the world. But like having that time where... You don't have to keep it together. Like, you can let go. It's just so powerful. You can be all of yourself. And if on that day it's the crying version of yourself or your vulnerable or emotional version of yourself, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And and, and all that mental health work 
that I love to do and support is, mm. is allowing people to step more into their skin mm. and drop the guard of having to be roles, play roles in our lives. And, and if you can do that on your mat and start there, and you can come to your mat, I say it's be the sum of all of your beautiful parts here today. Because the mat is, I know this is a terrible analogy or metaphor, but it's, it's the only space that personally I find where I'm not judged, that I can just be myself. Yeah, no, I think that's a great message to teach and to share. Mm, mm. So um, how about we rewind it a little bit? Um, I'm curious about how you discovered yoga. Yeah, great question. (laughs) (laughs) First of all, in a past life, I used to train teachers at Les Mills, uh, which is kind of like Fitness First in Australia, but they have group fitness classes now around the world. We I, totally have Les Mills in Melbourne, like most yeah. gyms have Les Mills classes on. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So early on in the days, I used to train teachers around the world when it first went, started going international. Anyway, so 15 years ago, I was uh, also a performer in South Africa and I injured my Achilles. I ripped it and I had to come home. And my physio said to me, the only thing that will allow you to, with Achilles injury, it's quite uh, traumatic. and the lower part of the ankle is the only thing that I could do was yoga to, because it was low and no impact and it allowed gentle stretching into that area just to, and I started it because it was physical at first. And I went to at the gym, Les Mills up in Auckland where I was living at the time. I went to this really amazing teacher who's still teaching these days. uh, And uh, I started for the physical aspects, but on the very first class that I did, I was humbled in such a great way, quite literally brought to my knees. And then I fell in love with it because I realised it wasn't about the physical at all. Hmm. When you were, because you like dance professionally, right? Um, I'm wondering, you must have tapped into that kind of flow of creative energy and just kind of being present in the moment with dance. What are the similarities with dance and with yoga for you, or is it completely different? No, I I mean, that's why I fell in love with it quite quick and in a deep way because I'd already been disciplined, I suppose, in that that way of moving, focused, that one-pointed focus that you can't get hard with dance, and I love to move my body. But... Yeah, especially the vinyasa practice, which I did, which didn't come for that. That was fifteen years ago when I first did my first class, and so five years later, I tried all types of yoga. By the way, it, I started with ashtanga, and then moved to hatha, and then had a little kind of one month, and that's all I could handle uh, affair with Bikram, and then <laughs> uh, and then I did some kundalini. So I've tried all the styles. And then five years after the, my first yoga class, I did vinyasa. And that's where it really, I was like, oh, this speaks to me. It's that beautiful synergy between breath and movement, which felt like dancing. Like I really do. I feel like I'm dancing when I'm doing vinyasa. Uh, and it was just a more gentler and more mindful way of moving my body, not kind of smashing it like I used to as a dancer. Yeah, yeah, because it's not a performance practice. It's something that you're doing for you. Totally. And that's what really shifted. And like I say, around it used to be physical at first. And the thing that humbled me, right, was in that first, very first class, was I was next to this older lady. She was like oh, 65. I can see her face. And she just, she must have been an ex dancer. And I, and I, was standing next to her and in those days we just did it on the carpet. You didn't have a mat. And <laughs> and she was just gracefully moving through her practice and eyes closed. So no attention on me. And because my whole life up until then had been so physically based, I was like, it was like a athletic endeavour. I was competing with her. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I remember breathing and, and, uh, and I remember, I remember, next to her doing warrior two and trying to lunge really deep. And I was like, <laughs> <trying> to, <laughs> like 
to compete next to her and she had no mind about me. She wasn't uh-huh. even paying attention, her eyes closed. And then the teacher, Mandy, came up, put her hand on my shoulder and was speaking to the whole class, but it really kind of hit me. Ego school. She just put her hand on my shoulder as she passed me and she goes, and sometimes you just don't need to try so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it literally, a oh, child's pose. Yeah. <laughs> and then I realise, oh, it's not a competition, Jane. And the only person that I'd really been in competition with was me. Mm. Mm. And it was that softening. <laughs> It was that softening that really made me fall in love with yoga and, you know, because I'm good at the young. I've, I've had that structure and that discipline in my life of the young and what how I would say that that shows up in my life is all the successes. But as you so beautifully put it earlier, it's been the yin and the softness in my life, the practice, actual physical practice of yin that has brought me into this harmonious kind of place that I'm still working on to balance, but definitely more I'm finding in my life these days. Oh, beautiful. And so did you know from the beginning that you wanted to teach or how did that realisation come to you? No, nah, I just really, from all of this, you're probably getting that I'm an A-type personality. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so when I started to fall in love with the with the spiritual practice of yoga, like the realisation that, yoga and the spirituality of it was actually just what I learned being brought up Māori. I kind of, my type personality wanted to just like a sponge soak up all the information. So I remember after that, after ripping my Achilles, I read and falling in love with maybe the potential of knowing more about spirituality. I read like 20 self-help books. <laughs> and, and it really just, I don't know, kind of solidified that I wanted to just know more about yoga. So I never, ever really wanted to be a teacher. And so eight years ago, I was still in Australia. I was living there and I stumbled into the studio, Power Living Studio in Bondi Junction. I've been practicing at lots of different studios around Body, Mind, Life, for example, in, in Sydney, in Surrey Hills. But then when I walked into Power Living, it was like, oh, I, I feel like I'm at home, like the feeling I hope that I created our Palavin studio here. It's how I felt when I was in Bondi Junction. And uh, and then the, the lady, the studio manager at the time said to me, you should do our teach training. I hadn't even told her that I used to teach aerobics and train teachers, et cetera. So I said, yeah, I suppose, yeah, yeah, definitely. So that was you know, I'd already been doing yoga for seven years and I did my teacher training and then right at the end of it, because I only just wanted to do it just to learn more about yoga. Yeah, at yeah. End, at the end of it, I remember having to get up and teach and Duncan said to me, oh, and then I taught and he stood up and he clapped and I thought that was really weird. <laughs> it's like, I've taught thousands of teachers, but I cannot remember someone who can who, who who speaks it like you do. And I was like, oh, wow, that's that, thank you. That's amazing. He goes, you should think about teaching because he knew that I would do one. And then I did and then I fell in love with it. And it's really about sharing for me, teaching, is sharing what yoga means to me. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. And so what made you decide to start your own studio, just an extension of that? Again, the A-type personality. Oh, this is <laughs> <laughs> no, it shifted because once I started teaching, I and Sydney got asked to teach a lot quite quickly because there weren't many male teachers and certainly none that looked like, like me were a uh, Māori fella with tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> so it, um, word spread quite quick and I was, yeah, just teaching a lot and I loved it. I loved it and I loved it and I saw how... I remember someone saying to me, quite a senior teacher who I used to love, and she started coming to my classes, and I was like, oh, my God, like it's almost like your teacher becomes your student, and that freaked me out. I was like, oh, my God, why are you coming to my class? I love your classes. And she was like, because you speak from your heart, Jace. And I I remember thinking, I don't understand what it means because that's just all I've ever done. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> and, and she was like, no, but then you also put it in your words and I've never heard yoga being spoke about in the way that you do it. I, I was like, oh, wow, okay, so maybe they're just I'm just a bit different. And then I started to realise that I was teaching in a country that was awesome and I loved it and I fell in love with Aussie and I stayed there for 10 years. But maybe perhaps, oh, I remember coming home and I reconnected with my mum who I hadn't, because remember I was brought up with my grandparents mm. and they were my dad's parents and I'd never met my mum. And so four years ago, I reconnected with her. I came back to Wellington. A series of events, which is in a whole other interview. But, <laughs> um, but she inspired me to come back home, to reconnect and start a relationship with her, reconnect with my brother, mend the relationship with my dad. And then also share my love of yoga with my people mm. because I'd fallen in love with it so much and also make a difference. I remember having a dream and my nan who had passed had said, this is bigger than you, boy. <laughs> that makes me. So, it makes me. <laughs> It humbles me because I, I feel like I feel like this is what I've really been put here to do. Beautiful. Yeah. That's amazing. And it seems like with everything that you do, you're really carrying on all of those beautiful lessons that your nan taught you from, you know, the earliest age. They're like speaking from your heart and being true to your culture and sharing what you love and that kind of connectedness of everything. Mm. So no wonder that she's visiting you in your dreams to tell you how proud she is of you. Yeah. Well, I, still, I mean, I know all this and it, it still, uh, still still need that reminder. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just like to say something else as well. Like it just really struck me as we've been talking to you, you know, you kind of mentioned that you'd been to some classes where it felt like the teacher put themselves on a different level to their students with the yoga philosophy somehow. And I think it's what makes your, how you teach and how you express yourself so special that you are living this philosophy through your heart and not like it's something that you've mastered and that you've just transcended the reality of everyday life and emotion and struggle, but like you're using these practices to, live through all of that and I think it just gives other people that permission to not be together all the time to be able to like let go and to feel the feelings that they're feeling and it's such a powerful gift to share to give people that safe space to do that so thank you so much and thank you so much for everything that you're sharing with us today Mm. well thank you for seeing that from one class <laughs> and, you know, obviously other, other things that are I mean, what you probably may see from what I'm doing and you, I mean you got it it's just been an example you know I, I can't I can't it's just lip service when you say yoga says we should do this etc cetera, etc cetera, the eight limbs but if you're not practicing it then it's just words And so I say to my teachers, walk the talk, do your yoga off the mat. Mm. We do yoga on the mat so we can be yoga off the mat. And um, thank you. I'm so happy that you get that. I want to be an example and I want to keep sharing from that space of I haven't got it all together and it is, it's a daily practice. It's a practice. (laughs) And I think it's like the day you think you've got it all together, like that's when you stop learning and you stop growing. Mm. Like that's what life's about, like figuring it all out. And isn't that exciting? Mm. <laughs> and you, you mentioned that you, you wanted to, you know, bring yoga back to your people. And, and I think that sort of brings us on to uh, nicely to your Mind3 mindfulness program 
because I understand that that integrates a lot of your Maori spirituality into yoga and mindfulness. So I'd really like to hear about that. Yeah, it, to, to be honest, it's just evolved very quickly into this something that, again, I keep hearing my name to so like, this is bigger than you, boy. And it started as just going to teach some yoga and sit meditation to some kids who have been a bit naughty. And then my friend said to me, you're onto something. We were at this fitness awards last year and another friend said to me, you should do this for kids right throughout New Zealand. You're a perfect role model. You're a male first and, and you're Maori. You have tattoos and you're, you know, like he just talked about how it's, it's, it's the people are not going to expect me to speak about yoga. And so now fast forward, M3 is a mindfulness program that weaves Māori mythology and I can't call it yoga at schools because of all of the religious and secular limitations that still exist, unfortunately, mm-hmm. in our society. So it really is at, it, at its heart a meditation yoga session that teaches kids the Māori mythology. Because uh, right now in New Zealand, there are so many diverse cultures, and I love that, much like Australia in that way. But none of the kids who have come here from other countries know the country that they're from and the only thing they know about Maui for example who is one of our demigods and one of our kind of superhero characters in Maori mythology is that he was a character in the Moana movies (laughs) (laughs) and so but he's many things and there's some really beautiful stories that allow the kids to have a sense of that word again belonging Mm. to where they're from so we start the session with a karakia and then we tell the story of the day. And for example, today I was just at a school before I came here. I will meet with you guys tonight. And the story was about Rata and the Totara tree. And this character Rata cuts down a tree to make a canoe for his family so that they can catch heaps of food for the village without asking permission from the god of the forest. Mm. And the theme is respect. So these children, they take away from the, from the lesson a story, a theme, then we put it in their bodies. So we simatize the movement, uh, the story in their bodies through moving, yogic movement. Uh, And then we finish the session. Well, we begin the session, sorry, with breath. So their awareness of breath. And then we end with meditation and breath. Uh, So they have a takeaway as a breath technique to be able to use whenever they're, you know, anxious or a little bit crazy in the head. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and and they also have a um, visualization. I take them through a visualization in their little mini shavasana at the end, so they they can consider how can they be m- more respectful in their lives, like Rata needed to be before he chopped down the tree, for example. Oh, and so, great. yeah, and so these kids are. Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, it's just gone off, and that was nine months ago when I had the idea of starting it. And what was a passion project is now uh, I've got a uh, PhD student and the professor of psychology doing research on the program now. I'm writing a paper about it. Oh, oh that's wow. fantastic! I'm going up to Auckland in three weeks to be interviewed for three different TV programs about it. So it's kind of, yeah, it's just, it's like I said, it's bigger than me and I just stay open. I keep using the mantra, just be open, open to receive. <laughs> and so are you running all of the sessions or are you training other people as well to facilitate? I didn't have even fact, I hadn't even factored that in and I've had to just meet with my business, a guy who, who's our business mentor for Power Living. I have just met with him the other day about a business plan for M3 now because now it's a business. <laughs> you know, it's, well, it's, it was just me going to a couple of schools, and now I'm at five schools in Wellington, and when I'm in Auckland, I'm going to be at four there. So it's, at the moment, it's just me. But the whole idea now is to have it online so that everything schools do is online now. So, mm-hmm. for example, lessons can be online. And so this will be an online video and I've got on video my first video in a couple of weeks and having the kids from the schools that have been participating with me on the video with me. Oh, nice. So it's just not a 
middle-aged man <laughs> <laughs> teaching them some shapes. Yeah, so it'll be accessible hopefully by the beginning of 2019. There'll be 10 videos of 10 Māori myths with a theme of the day and techniques to be able to create more mindful children. Wow, that's amazing. That's so great. Mm, mm. Thank you. <laughs> See what I mean? Like the A type. Yeah, you can't help yourself. It's <laughs> <laughs> just going to be one class. <laughs> I think, as well, though, like your other real gift is to tap into a need that people obviously have. Yes, well, uh, what, okay, so I, I didn't really share the real reason why I, why I felt that there was, there was a need is. I read this freaking alarming statistic that since 2006, the use of antidepressant and anxiety medicine in children has increased in New Zealand by 80%. Oh, wow. Wow. I know. And I was like, oh, my gosh, how can I help? Mm. With the tools that I have, with the skill set that I have, how can I help? Because that is... I, my nephew, I think about my nephews and nieces. My brother has 10 kids, bless him. <laughs> no I, wonder you're good at working with kids. <laughs> well, well and, and I'm a big kid myself. That's the <laughs> other side of my I can be very And I don't want them to, like, also, I don't know if you guys know, but our youth suicide rates are so high in New Zealand that they bump up the overall global average because right. we're, wow. we're the highest in the world and also male suicide which is why I, I i do the work i do for male is male suicide is the highest suicide rates in the world and and maori male mm. suicide rates are the highest in amongst the statistic of new zealand suicide rates so Oh my gosh! Yeah, well, yeah. Like I said, what can I do to to offer to be of service? What can I do with? Because it, it it got me through some depressing times after injuring myself. Mm-hmm. Four of my mates, four of my personal male friends, have passed away of suicide, and that can't happen. I don't want our kids to grow up and be a statistic. I guess as well. The other side of it is as someone who works with mental health and someone who really supports a lot of other people, uh, what are the self-care strategies that you have in place to take care of yourself as you navigate all of that? Because it could be a heavy burden to bear when you read statistics like that and you really want to help. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier about being an example is like self-care has never really featured as a priority. I think I was listening to a podcast. I'm big on podcasts because as I drive to these schools, I just put on a podcast and listen to podcasts like, you know, like you guys. Yeah. (laughs) And this person said, I come last in this interview that I was listening to. I come last. And then the the guy who was interviewing was, got really angry as this American guy and he was like, how dare you neglect yourself when you've got four kids and, you know, you're also this in your life and you're this in your life and blah, blah, blah. Because if you're not good, and this is what really resonated with me, is if you're not good, then how can the things that you have to do in your life, taking care of your four kids and whatever your job is, be good? Mm. If you're not good yourself. Oh, I was like, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And then I realized I wasn't really taking good care of myself. I, and so that, so to answer your question, self-care is vital mm. for me. And I, as, and I don't mean this to sound selfish, but I do. I, I've got to take care of myself first because I've got so much to do in my life. Mm. That so much to do in my life c- cannot be at the cost of me not taking care of myself. You know and, also, I mean? and everything that you're doing is so important that you really can't do it to the best of your abilities if you're drained and you're exhausted and you aren't getting enough sleep and mm-hmm. 
like to be there for all of the people that you are, you need to be there for yourself and set that example as well. You got it, my love. And, and in the past, taking care of myself would have been going to the gym and smashing myself, mm. you know, working out. But these days, it's yin. It's making sure I'm in bed. You can ask my partner, I'm in, we're in bed by nine reading our books. <laughs> well, you know, uh, and, and that, and, and so my party. And my life has just shifted and changed. I have... Like I don't even real I don't even feel like I'm don't don't worry, I'm not gonna start, you know, adding in more things to that list of <laughs> achievements. But I, I feel like I'm only scratching the surface of mm, when I think about there's a there's a meme about Beyonce or Oprah has the same amount of hours that you have in your day. So what are you going to get up to? <laughs> you know, but I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of what I can offer. And since I'm taking care, better care of myself now, I have much more energy. I'm much brighter. I'm more connected. I'm more present. I'm, I'm the example of, I'm trying to be the example of the thing that I'm asking our kids to be, which is mindful, which is present. You know, and uh, and if I'm drained, then there's no way I can be those things. And I know when I teach kids, like that is a lot of energy. If mm. you are not fully like present and energized and just centered when you rock up for the kids, it doesn't go well. Like the kids can tell, and especially if you're oh, working with kids with behavioural issues already, that's not where yeah. you want to be. <laughs> And I try to give myself good. Like if, like today I taught at the studio teaching adults and then I had a half hour, I call it buffer time, and that was in the car and driving to the school. And those buffer times are really, because I've got a pretty packed schedule in my life, but if I don't have buffer times, then the next thing on my list can be affected because I haven't had enough downtime or space mm. between the things. So that, that half an hour from teaching adults this morning to driving out to the lower hut today was my buffer time of putting on just some meditation music and chilling. So that when I arrived, I, I was super grounded and anchored and all the things that I really wanted or hoped that the kids would find in this session that they were about to have for me. Yeah, it's so important. I find even um, when you're planning your schedule as well, like to give yourself that buffer time, you don't want to map things out so it's all best case scenario that if everything lines up and the traffic's fine, you can get there on time. Like you just want to give yourself time for if something happens on the way, it's not a disaster, like you've got that buffer, like just logistically as well as emotionally. You got it, you got it, yeah. And, and luckily I don't live in Sydney or somewhere that's busier where I'd have to double that buffer time, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which actually could be a good thing. But, yeah, I definitely do that. I'm more mindful. I mean, those to me are the take yourself care moments that I was speaking about, allowing myself some space before the next thing so I'm not just running myself ragged and emptying the tank. I'm also, I was going to add, um, I'm really into floating Oh. oh yeah! We made an ambassador for one of the float uh, float well. It's called the float uh, tank establishments here in Wellington, and that's been. I, I have to do one float a week. That's my dedication to myself. I think that's a, like a really good idea as well because, say, yoga has always been your your you time and your self-care time and then you start teaching yoga and you teach a lot of classes a week sometimes physically while you still do your own practice you need to have another thing that can kind of get you to that mindful meditative state that's not necessarily as tiring on your body because sometimes at the end of a busy teaching week that doesn't feel like balance so it's great to have things where you can just be still and you can just rest it's forced rest <laughs> it, is. Yeah. it is and these uh, yeah I'm very blessed in that way that I, I get to have that as a as my my way of taking care of myself yeah you're right because we give out so much it, when we're teaching so much energy that it's important even more important to fill your cup mm. so I've got, you know, I've got some really beautiful ways I'm mindful I have 
five things that I do to fill my cup each week. And one of them is date night, which I've got date night with my partner tonight. Oh, nice. nice. <laughs> got to have some date, some, some us time. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's important. Maybe we could uh, spiral back a little bit to your work with men's mental health. I'm just curious about how, how you got involved in that and, and what you actually started there. Well, it comes from and stems from my own personal loss of four friends, mm. coupled with that statistic of well, those two statistics of the alarmingly high male suicide rate in New Zealand and then mm, within Māori men. And so that, that, you know, how I said that teaching to me is really sharing. I was like, well, how can I share the benefits of yoga and meditation in a way that is user-friendly and palatable for men who perhaps have never ever considered that yoga or meditation was a way to deal with mental health issues. Mm. And so we've had many, I'd say five now, men's only yoga classes, which are really just, I remember the first one, because I'm a, I'm a boy of yoga, which is like this international kind of, band of brothers mm-hmm. um, the first one was with michael james wong who's actually a kiwi brought up in new zealand then moved over so in wellington so he was here at his home original home and uh so he came out to new zealand we did an event and then they just kind of like backed up it was a huge success we had 120 fellas oh, wow. the and then had about 60 afterwards of new men too coming to the studio and doing yoga, some for the very first time and then never came back again. <laughs> that's, a, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, but, but after every event that we've had, and just I'll talk about Brothers in Arms, which was a couple of weeks ago, after every event we've had, we've also had speakers. So men who have had mental health issues perhaps and have found their way of dealing with mental challenges. And I'm first person to say that yoga is just my preferred way. Mm -hmm. Meditation is my preferred way. But I also know that that may not be the only way that other fellas have of dealing with their challenges. And so I suppose I'm in a beautiful way because I get to provide a, a place to provide a platform for other men and I've, I've, I've been in Wellington, so I know lots of people who are willing to share their ways and their tools, their, their, their aren't perhaps yoga or aren't perhaps meditation or are even. And, like, for an example, we had um, a fellow, this big Māori fellow, Joe Harawira, who's kind of the quintessential warrior when you look at him, tattoos and muscly and Māori and works for New Zealand rugby, who his way of dealing is meditation. He used to be in the army, he fought in Afghanistan, he was a, a policeman before that. So all of those kind of like stereotypical A-type male roles, mm. but the softest, softest, most gentlest man sharing about meditation was really powerful because mm. it destroyed the stigma for guys who thought that yoga was just for girls or that meditation was just something that was woo-woo or out there, to hear it beautifully spoken about articulately from a, in a quotation marks, a Māori male, mm-hmm. was really powerful. A couple of weeks ago, we didn't even do the yoga portion of an event. We just called it Brothers in Arms. And we just, basically it was just a get fellas together and have a chat, talk. Because men don't, in New Zealand especially, I know I would say in Australia too, having lived there, don't talk about that shit. It's like, suck it up, bro, you'll be right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I just decided instead of yoga, just let's just have a place where people can come, have some kombucha, sit down, listen to some speakers who have all come from real kind of tough histories, had mental health challenges and this is how they dealt with that does it resonate with you let's have some questions and if you want to share about your life and perhaps what you do or where you're at then the floor is open and it was 
I actually had to go home and leave one of my staff because I was teaching the next morning because the fellas stayed for like two hours after the event. Oh, oh wow. Nice. That was my measure of success. That was like, oh, I couldn't have thought, I couldn't have wished for a better outcome. And it really seems to come back to that theme that's just been flowing through so much of the things that we've talked about, like just being you and connecting with other people but connecting to who you are and that being okay to share all of that stuff that sometimes we feel like we've got to bottle up because that's what society tells us. Yeah. So it's so powerful. Yeah, thank you. I, well, first of all, I need to be able to do that too. Like if I'm going to be... We all do, yeah. yeah. But if, it, if I'm going to hold an event, men need to know that it's been held by a fella who's willing to walk talk himself mm-hmm. and I'd be a, a, it's a safe I remember this guy he stood outside the door and he wouldn't walk in and, and he was like just right he, I saw him and he saw me see him and he walks behind the, the in the corridor he was walking like he hiding behind and I said it's okay man it's okay it's hard a eh, sometimes to go to somewhere where you don't really know mm. Mm. And and so I just went and sat down by the door and just made it a little bit more safer for him so he could see me. And then he came in and then little by little he sat down. We started talking, found something in common with him. And then, and then he stayed and not only did he stay, but he shared. And not only did he share, but he cried. Oh, and, and, the, and it just set the tone for, okay, this is – a place where y'all can just talk mm. Mm. and just your words, be yourself. Because it, it, what it seemed in the moment was he up until then, like many, many, many men, had bottled that shit up for so long mm. and had never had an opportunity or a space to be able to express and because he saw other men and because he felt safe, mm. he just let himself be vulnerable. And that was so powerful. Yeah, incredible. And obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but it seems like that ability to hold space for people and to help people feel safe within that is something that comes quite naturally to you. For other teachers who maybe feel like they struggle with that aspect or they, they're not sure what to do if someone doesn't feel like they're getting that vibe that someone doesn't feel comfortable in the class and they want to get better at creating that safe space. Um, have you got any kind of strategies or any maybe texts that people could go to? Like if holding space isn't something that comes naturally to you, what would be some ways to help to tap into that a bit more? It's a great question. I really love the teaching of Thich Nhat Hanh and I think it's called The Lotus. I've got it on my bookshelf. Let me just grab it. Anyway, the teachings basically speak about being a compassionate listener. And by that, I don't mean that someone's talking. They don't even have to talk for you your words before about picking up their vibe for you even to notice that someone's uncomfortable you've got to be in a space of listening connected is another way to say that Mm -hmm. you've got to see that someone's taking that harm or call it suffering and for you to hold space like I, i would say the way of holding space for me is listening not talking not reacting just listening and listening for the reason of actually hearing them. That's so powerful. I think as well, often the challenge is not knowing what to say and worrying about saying the wrong thing. So if your goal is to listen and to hear someone, then that really shifts that. You got it, because if you're hearing really what they say, then the words that come from a space of you being, we call it in yoga, shravana. It's the silence. It's the non, it's really hard. And we teach it on our teacher trainings when people are giving feedback or 
when you when someone's speaking to practice shravana because notice that when when people speak we, our tendency as humans and conditioning has taught us to jump in or give your version or in your head you're listening to someone going on my version of that and oftentimes a conversation can be like oh yeah I'm going to tell you about my version of what I just heard from you do you know what I mean so you're not actually listening mm. you're, you're already in your head wanting to them to shut up so that you can give your version uh, yeah, so that, you're waiting for your turn to speak. <laughs> yeah, sometimes that how that manifests is jumping in over people who haven't even finished what they were supposed to say, which means that you weren't listening, you weren't holding space for them at all. There was no silence. And in, in that silence, do you see, is where I truly feel is the connection. But... Mm. Beautiful. Well, we've heard some real words of, of wisdom from you today. And I was wondering if perhaps you could distill all of all of your work, all of your teachings down to a single lesson that you'd like to share with the world. What what would that be? My word that I keep thinking is aroha. Mm -hmm. Aroha translates, well, I'll give you the version of it's a Maori word that means love. And really all these things, all of these things that I've been speaking about today, when I think about it, I, I put, got my hand on my heart as I say it, is, is about really, and it's on my, if you turn the video on, it's on my mantelpiece, is love. Like all the spiritual teachings are like love more, love yourself more, love others more, love our universe, Mother Earth, all of it more. But to go even deeper than that, the word aro, the first bit of aroha, is a place. And ha in Māori, aroha, is breath. Mm. And so when you really are in love with yourself, and I don't mean that in the, I mean, you know, when you're really connected to yourself, mm. it's a quiet sense of breath, like a, like an exhale that here I am, I'm home. And then there's a breath that you share with others. That's why I love about yoga because we share breath. It would be that sharing breath with yourself and then with others, that connection, that love, that connects and binds us all because in our lives, in our lives, we're so about otherness and how different you are to me, separateness. But what about if we were all just the same? <laughs> and the thing that brought us together was love. <laughs> wow. Um, oh, thank you so much, yeah, Jace. Yeah, that was amazing. Oh, my gosh. Well, we've both got tears in our eyes <laughs> over here. <laughs> yeah. It's a pity you're in another country because I just want to give you a big hug. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Have you got anything else that you'd like to share? No. That's it. I hope that this inspires people to live from their heart and yeah, and love more. Gosh, this time in life, in, in this era, with what's going on in America and around the world, mm. isn't wouldn't love be just the most amazing healer of all of it? <laughs> mm, it really seems like something our world needs more of right now. So thank you for everything that you do to put that beautiful message out there. Mm. A true pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to share that through your channel. <laughs> I think Jace is an incredible teacher. He's so open to displaying his raw, authentic self and his explanation of aroha, I think, is just beautiful. This is why I added the words aroha nui to the end of the podcast. Aroha can mean love and nui means big. And though, just as you heard from Jace, it means so much more than that. Now, in our next episode, we are speaking with Jamie and Sarah, creators of Wayapa Wurik, a movement and meditation modality that draws from indigenous wisdom and connection to earth. It was a truly wonderful experience speaking with them, so look out for that one. 
All right, if you like the theme music, it's called Baby Robots by Go Soul, and you should definitely check out his music at gosoul.bandcamp.com. We'll see you again in two weeks. Aroha nui, big, big love. <laughs>